It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the New World Order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to, well, give me just a second, I gotta get this microphone straight, another edition of the Remnant Report. I guess the mic doesn't have to be in the shot. As long as you all can hear me okay, that's all that matters. Um, tonight, we are going to be having a very, uh, very, maybe you could consider it controversial, uh, I wouldn't, but a very a, a, a program covering a confusing subject to say the least tonight we are going to be studying the final judgment the at the very end of time when Christ comes back to judge the quick and the dead uh, we are going to find out all of what scripture actually says about this judgment because in different interpretations, different denominations, and different um, doctrinal systems in the body of Christ, there are different beliefs about the resurrection and the judgment. Um, some believe, of course, that there is two judgments. There is the um, judgment seat of Christ for the believers, and then, of course, there is the great white throne judgment. and in most um, evangelical interpretations, be it dispensationalism or people who aren't dispensationalists but still have a futuristic premillennial view of eschatology, believe that these two judgments are separated by a period of a thousand years. And we're going to go to the scripture tonight and we're going to see what the Bible says about these two judgments or the judgment period, if there's just one judgment. Um, so we may be touching on uh, the millennium sum, but only where it you know has to do with the uh, judgments. And we are definitely going to be going to scripture. I am going to uh, be pulling scriptures up on the screen for you guys. And um, I've got... There, this is by not even almost all of the scriptures that have to do with the uh, final judgment. But I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven scriptures that I found that really describe the judgment of the righteous and the wicked, which is what we are going to be talking about tonight. I don't know how many of you are actually. Um, tuned in to watch live. I don't expect to have many live viewers tonight simply because um, this program was not scheduled. I didn't advertise it beforehand. I haven't even shared it on Facebook or YouTube. Um, and it's not going to be a program, an episode of the Remnant Report in the normal sense. This is going to be more of a Bible study, which is why I didn't you know, do all the rigmarole of sharing it and advertising it because those of you who get the notifications whenever the remnant report goes on those of you who are you know the viewers who watch 
every episode and follow the Remnant Report just so happen to be those who I know are actually um, walking out their salvation. Give me just a second. I want to make sure that I have the uh, chat up because I do not see anyone chatting. And, I, you know, I, that could be for many reasons, but... uh. All right, I'm going to take that off, and if anybody comments, I'll be able to see it. All right, we are going to, uh, what I was saying was those of you who, you know, follow the program, you know, whenever you get a notification from Facebook or YouTube, you tune in, and there's usually about um, between 10 and 20 who get the notifications on YouTube and watch every week, and there's usually about 50 to 100 who get the notifications and watch live on Facebook whether I share the program and advertise it or not. So this program is at least the, the live edition of it will be for those of you who are you know serious about your walk with Christ, who want to know more, who want to edify yourselves and grow in the Lord. That's why you know I didn't go through all of the normal routine of sharing the program and also, you know, even uh, advertising it beforehand. And to be honest, I uh, didn't have plans to do this Bible study um, until earlier today after I talked to Sister Mary Callie. We were actually speaking about this very subject, about the resurrection. And I'm actually, the main reason why I didn't, you know, do a uh, preview, uh, well, I didn't promote it and didn't do, I didn't share it and all that, is because I don't necessarily want a ton of people watching it because we have a group of strong believers in Christ. There's maybe six or seven of us that meet twice a week, once for uh, prayer and testimony on Wednesday evenings, and then on Thursday we have Bible study. And what I am going to be talking about with you guys tonight is actually what I'm going to have Bible study on this Thursday, but Thursday's Bible study will be far more in depth than tonight's uh, study will be because you know we'll it, it won't be in this type of setting in a uh, a live stream type setting. Um, you know we'll all be together in a Bible study, so you know we'll be able to actually you know I'll, I'll give do the Bible study, and then people will be able to ask questions, and we'll be able to have a dialogue about it, which is, you know, the one downside of doing it this way, live streaming. Sorry, I hit the, the mic stand with my foot, which I'm sure you guys heard, and I apologize for that. Um, I, uh, I hope you guys can hear me better. I hope the sound quality is better. Thank Sister, I, I thank Sister Mary Callie for uh, my new microphone. Um, it usually picks up pretty good. I usually don't have to get way up here to it. Um, I can usually be about you know this far back, and it picks up pretty well. And the sound quality um, of the last few shows has been better because of the new microphone. So thank you, Sister Mary Kelly, for the new mic. Uh, the uh, first, well, uh, speak of Mary Kelly, and there she is. Um, Mary, I don't know if you were tuned in. Um, if you if you can, I was saying earlier that I didn't share the program um, and I didn't advertise it because I wasn't planning on doing this. And I'm not having a, a normal, you know, episode of the Remnant Report. This is more of a Bible study. And it's going to be on the same subject that we are going to have Bible study on um, Thursday night. And it's also the same subject that you and I were talking about earlier, which is the uh, resurrection it, and the judgment. Is there going to be... One judgment of both the righteous and the wicked, one resurrection and one judgment, or is there going to be two judgments separated by a thousand years? Now, tonight, we, like I said earlier, we will not, of course, be getting, um, we won't be going as deep into it as we will be in the Bible study Thursday. But um, if if you can, um, maybe you could share the program, you know, to a couple of places. I had planned on waiting until after I was done to share it. But since you're here, if you don't mind, you can share it some. That, that'll be fine. I am uh, going to pull 
the uh, Bible up on the screen, so I apologize for my um, my fingers being in front of the camera. All right, we are going to come on now. All right, the first scripture that we are going to be looking at is in Matthew. And we are going to be looking at Matthew chapter 25. So if you have your Bibles, you can uh, follow along and you can uh, turn in your Bibles. Uh, but we're going to be in Matthew 25, starting with verse 31. Now, of course, this is the, uh, the chapter right after the famous Matthew 24 passage where, uh, you know, Jesus is describing the end times and we um we're going to look at matthew 24 as well to look at uh the um uh the resurrection but we're gonna uh start now and look at matthew 25 starting in verse 31 and it says when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he, shall, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. I was naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when uh, saw we thee hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we saw thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw, saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So, starting off by, now we're not going to, we're not going to make a decision based solely on uh, these scriptures because we know that we are to prove all things in the mouth of two or three witnesses so we are going to go like i said we've got uh 11 different uh scriptures we're going to go to and we are going to see if we can get to the bottom of this but just from what jesus says here in matthew 25 it does not sound like there is going to be two judgments or that is, is separated by a thousand years i mean it just doesn't it um, it does not sound like there's going to be what is called the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. Now, I'm not saying that there will be or there won't be, that it is that way or it isn't that way. Uh, I am just saying that based on what Jesus says here in Matthew 25, uh, you know, starting with verse 31, it says, um, the Son of Man is going to come back in his glory with all the holy angels and he's going to sit upon the throne. And he's going to gather everybody, all of the people, good and bad, the wicked and the righteous, unto him. And he's going to set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. So, I have to say that if I was going on this scripture alone, I would have to say that this is one judgment, my friends. But I'm not going on this scripture alone. We're going to look at some more, and I'm not going to make a decision yet, and I don't want you to either. And no matter what. I say, um, you know, at the end of the program, after we go through all the scriptures, you know, regardless to whether I say there's going to be one judgment uh, at the resurrection or there's going to be two, don't take my word for it. Even though I will be pulling the scriptures up on the screen, I do not want you to take my word for it. Don't believe it because I say it. I want you to research it, read the scriptures for yourselves, and most importantly, pray and pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom and discernment. And if you ask for wisdom according to the scriptures, it will be given unto you. 
So please don't take my word or anybody else's word for that matter other than the word of God and the Holy Spirit. Now, the second scripture that we are going to look at tonight is going to be Daniel. We're going to go to Daniel chapter 12. And Daniel 12, starting in verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even unto that same time. And at thy time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And here we go, verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, that's two scriptures. And again, you know, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, says that after the tribulation, because that's what Daniel 12, 1 is talking about, the time of trouble is the tribulation. And it says that those that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt so that is a uh, two scriptures one new testament one old testament that both show one resurrection and one judgment but we're still not going to make any decisions we're not going to make our mind up yet we are uh, going to go back to the new testament and we are going to the book of john book of john chapter five we're going to go to verse number 28 now John number 5, starting in verse 28, says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now, that's three, guys. That's three. Uh, Verse 28, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which the Christians that are in the grave shall hear his voice. No, that's not what it said, is it? It said, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves, everyone, all people, good, bad, sheep, goats, believers, non-believers, righteous, wicked, all who are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. All right. Well, let's see. I, uh, I think I may have, may have written this down wrong. I'm going to go to it anyway. We're going to be in the book of Revelation. The next scripture is in the book of Revelation. But I think I may have written the scripture down wrong. But I'm going to go to it anyway really quick. I wrote it down wrong. Um, so give me just a second. I can find it. With, if you would just give me a second. Well, I thought I could find it, but I don't see it. Well, no matter. Um, I'm uh, pretty sure that it was See what 2012 says. Okay, here we go. Yes. Revelation chapter 20. I had Revelation chapter 2 written down, but I was supposed to write 20. And I saw, well, first, um, verse 11, because I don't want to be taking scripture out of context. And I said we may talk about the millennium tonight. And to be fair, I'm going to go up and I'm going to read Revelation 20 from the beginning. Because if there was any part of scripture that uh, described something other than the righteous and the wicked being resurrected and judged at the same time, it would be here in Revelation 20. So we are going to look at the entire book, the entire, excuse me, the entire chapter, Revelation chapter 20. We're going to start with verse 1. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. 
and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So, you know, according to Revelation 20 here, there is going to be a first resurrection. It says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, I <laughs> am going to explain, because, all right, first of all, if you read to there, it says, um, and then verse 7 says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. I apologize for my dogs barking. I believe uh, my wife may be coming home now. So if she is, then that's what they're barking at. And I, again, I apologize. Uh, it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, which that word hell there is not the lake of fire. That word hell there, um, I wish we were in the Blue Letter Bible because I could show you that word hell there is actually Hades, not Gehenna. Um, so it should be death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, which is Gehenna. The lake of fire is hell. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So, if we read Revelation 20, the entire chapter, by itself, it seems to do what? It seems to contradict what Matthew 25, Daniel 12, and John 5. It seems to contradict what Jesus said. But we know that there is no way that scripture can contradict itself. That's impossible. So, I am going to do my best to explain this to you, but before I do, we're going to look at some more scriptures. Uh, we're going to go to the book of Acts, uh, chapter 17. Verse 31. And it says, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. So, of course, we see that there was some here who, you know, they didn't believe and they mocked because they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And we know the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They were a group of, um, of the, uh, you know, you had the, they were the Jewish elite. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the religious leaders. And the Jewish religious leaders known as the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Uh, we're going to go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to read as many scriptures as I can before... We try to make any kind of decision, and even before I try to explain Revelation 20 and the way it's actually not contradicting the other scriptures. Now we're going to go to verse 52, and it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 
at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. For when this corruptible shall, shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is, uh, of course, talking about the resurrection of the righteous to immortality and everlasting life. So this particular scripture is not about both judgments or, you know, the judgment of the righteous and the wicked, but just the righteous and the resurrection of just the righteous. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 is also just about the resurrection of the righteous, so I'm going to skip that one. And I'm going to go to Acts chapter 24, verse 15. And it says, and have hope towards God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So we see here again that, of course, there is going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. It doesn't actually say whether it's at the same time or separate judgments here, but uh, we're going to go to Acts 17 really fast and look at verse 18. And it says, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will the ba this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So they saw this as new doctrine. He was standing in the midst of Mars Hill, talking to the the Romans, and he's literally standing in the midst of where the, the shrines to the Roman gods were in Athens. And uh, there um, was a place there, this actually has nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight, but there was a place there, um, there was an altar there that had this inscription that said, to the unknown god. And so they were actually... They actually had an altar up to God, to the Father, to the Creator, but they knew him as the unknown God. Now, the last scripture we're going to look at before we go back to Revelation 20, and I do my best to um, explain it, is going to be 1 Corinthians. We're going to go back to 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to go to verse 35. And it says, I should have just read the entire uh, chapter of 1 Corinthians, but it says, But some men will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it first die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat, or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body, as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is, an is another. There is one glory of the sun, and an another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, then it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not the first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, 
neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be written, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. I've already read that part, so I'm not going to read it again. Again, guys, I apologize. Right now, I'm sure you can hear um, <laughs> the commotion going on out there. That is uh, my wife and my son coming home, and uh, neither one of them probably know that I'm in here live streaming. If they did, they would have come in quietly. So I apologize for that. Um, but back to the scriptures and the study. Where the scriptures that we saw that talked about the two, um, re the 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 one resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked, and the judgment of both the righteous and the wicked. Those scriptures um, seem to say one thing, where Revelation twenty seems to say that there is two resurrections. And blessed is he that comes to the first resurrection. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 20. And let's see if we can figure this out. Um, now, at the beginning of Revelation 20, we see an angel come down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, I am going to, uh, I'm going to kind of go back to something that I talked about in the Searching for the Millennium series that we did. I did a four-part series called Searching for the Millennium. And I went through all of the different um, beliefs about the millennial reign of Christ. And uh, there is a belief that is definitely supported by scripture that puts the beginning of the millennium first of all the thousand years in this view it's called amillennialism and the thousand years is not literal but figurative and it actually begins uh at the ascension of christ when he goes and sits on his throne in glory at the right hand of the father and we also, um, there is, in that belief, the millennium goes from that time all the way unto the second coming of Christ. And the binding of Satan happens at that, at, you know, at the beginning of the millennium. I would say sometime in between the, the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. And then the millennium would start at the ascension. Now, um, the book of John tells us that Satan, Jesus himself says that Satan was, is cast out. We see Satan being cast out of the world in the book of John. And I will uh, I'll give you guys the scripture so you can go and read that for yourself for time's sake. Um, and I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to pull it up on um, the screen simply because I want to uh, stay right here in Revelation on the screen. But the, uh, the scripture where Jesus talks about um, Satan being cast out. Let's see if we can find it. All right, here we go. It is John chapter 12. Um, it's actually verse 31, but if you uh, go to, um, if you go back to uh, 
You can go back, I guess, to uh, verse 24 and read from there. And uh, then verse 30 says, Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. For now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. So Jesus literally says here in John 12 that when he dies, when he goes to the cross, that there is literally a judgment of this world. Now, he does not mean the final judgment. The judgment that he is talking about is the judgment of these principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness in this world, mainly just who it identifies here, the prince of this world. It says, and now is the judgment of this world, and now shall the prince of this world be cast out. So we see Satan cast out in John 12, which is the same thing. Uh, that is talked about here in Revelation 20, and I have, there I go, hitting the mic stand again. I know that was loud, and I apologize. Um, we talked about how the book of Revelation is not in chronological order. It goes back and forth from the first century to the final end time. It does that quite often. You see that in Revelation chapter 1, 2, uh, and 3, and then you see it again in Revelation chapter 12, and in this particular way of looking at the millennium, you also see it here in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, according to this view of the millennium and prophecy and the judgment, is the same thing that is talked about here in John chapter 12. When Satan is cast out here, it is the same of him as him being laid hold and bound for a thousand years, which isn't actually a thousand years, but is instead the time between when Jesus ascended and sat on his throne, and we believers, all of us who accept him, follow him, and especially the martyrs who were killed for him, they are literally, uh, we are literally ruling and reigning with him. What Jesus came talking about the entire gospel is the gospel of the kingdom and Jesus came preaching that the kingdom of God was at hand so if the kingdom of God was at hand when Jesus came in the first century then the kingdom of God has been at hand ever since and we have been ruling and reigning with him and even those who don't believe in amillennialism even those who believe in a future thousand year reign they still admit and agree that, you know, Jesus is on his throne and we are ruling and reigning with him. But they just see it as two different reigns, I guess. But if we go down um, to verse 4, because this is the verse where things get confusing as far as the judgments and the resurrections. It says, and I saw thrones. And, oh, let me back up. Verse 3 says, and the, the last half of verse 3 says that, after the thousand years, Satan must be loosed a little season. So, the time that he is loosed for a little season, to me, it makes way more sense for him to be loosed during the time that is described in Revelation. I mean, we see the rising of the dragon, the beast. Um, we see a, a Polyon, Abaddon. Uh, you know, the angel of the bottomless pit, the destroyer, rise out of the bottomless pit, which is exactly where uh, Satan is cast into and shut up for an uh, unknown period of time or a thousand years, however you want to look at it. So, with the way the book of Revelation is written, with the symbols and the back and forth time frame, the nonlinear time frame, this can certainly be explained to where it doesn't contradict the rest of the scripture. But I want to go to verse 4. It says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Now, 
who is this that is sitting upon the thrones doing the judgment? I mean, is this the righteous being judged here? I mean, is it really? Does it say that the righteous are being judged here? It says, and I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. It doesn't say that they were judged. It says judgment was given unto them. Now, that could mean literally that they were judged, or it could mean that the power to judge was given to them. And it says, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, the only part of this, the only part of this that would make me, myself, personally believe that this is happening um, at the end of the tribulation, you know, after the second coming of Christ, is the part that says, you know, they had not worshipped the beast or his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. But allow me to uh, present something to you. Uh, let me give you something to think about here for a second. In the first century, the first and second century, but definitely the first century, um, there was quite a few, now I know that when I say this, I am going to sound like I am giving a preterist or a partial preterist viewpoint here. Allow me to say that I am in no way preterist, nor am I suggesting a preteristic viewpoint. But what I am saying is this, that those who were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, there were many people beheaded and killed for the word of God and the witness of Jesus in the first century and second century. And even after that, throughout history, um, I mean, the, the, the Roman Catholics during the Inquisition, they killed many true Christians as heretics. And the way they killed them was beheading them. Uh, and although there is going to be a final beast, a, you know, one last Antichrist. If we go back in Scripture, John tells us in his epistles that there will be many Antichrist. So, it is my contention that from the period of the first century all the way through history up until the final beast comes, the, the beast that is going to rise and Satan is going to enter into him, I believe there has been many beasts or many antichrists as far as uh, a type of antichrist going back to, um, you know, Nero is one. Titus, the emperor T Titus who uh, destroyed Jerusalem and the temple fulfilling prophecy in 70 AD, he was a type of antichrist. Um, the Pope is a type of Antichrist, and there have been many Antichrists. And so all of these who did not bow to the beast, you know, any of these beasts, all the way up until the final beast, you know what I mean? But there were many who were beheaded. And guess what? Even if this is talking about the final beast, those who were beheaded for the witness of Christ in the first and second century definitely did not worship the beast or his image or receive his mark because they were not, I mean, they were not alive during the end times. Well, they were alive during the end times because the end times started, you know, when Christ ascended into heaven, but they were not alive during the tribulation. So they definitely did not worship the beast or receive his mark, no matter how you look at it. So looking at it that way, let's just say that this, these people in verse 4 are one of two different categories of people. They are either the people who were beheaded and killed for the cause of Christ in the first and second century, or they were the ones who were crucified with Christ and resurrected with him. And that is all of us. All believers, every single believer, when you accept Christ and then you are baptized, when you are born again, that baptism 
is showing you die, go into the grave, just like Christ did, and then resurrect. To me, that would be the first resurrection. And verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. Right? So, the if we die to our sins and then live and reign with Christ while we're alive on this earth, then we have already taken part in the first resurrection. And if we reign with Christ, all of us, from the first century believers all the way until he comes back again, then we have literally ruled and reigned with him for quote-unquote a thousand years. That would be the millennium. Now, I am not saying, thus saith the Lord on this. I'm not saying that that is the way it is. I'm telling you a way that it can be looked at. And I'm telling you to search these things out and decide for yourself. But I will say that looking at it that way and seeing that when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison to deceive the nations once more, that sounds to me like when he comes back in the, for the tribulation for his final, you know, his final battle against the saints and against the Most High God. Um, because when Jesus comes back, friends, he's coming back to judge the quick and the dead. He's coming back to judge the righteous and the wicked. And he's coming back to set up an everlasting kingdom. A kingdom that will never end. Not some Jewish utopia where the Gentiles are going to be servants of the Jews. And where the Jews are going to live like kings and, you know, have virgins deliver. I mean, it's... It's ridiculous, the, the view of the millennial reign from the viewpoint of dispensationalism. The dispensational viewpoint of the millennium is the exact same as the non-Christian Jewish version of the end times. They're forever. They don't believe in going to heaven like we Christians do. They believe that they are going to have an everlasting kingdom here on this earth that is going to be set up. The same way that dispensationalism says that the millennium will be. The only difference is the Jews in Orthodox Judaism don't believe this is something that's going to end after a thousand years. They believe that it's set up forever. Well, I'd have to agree with them on that. Although I disagree completely that it's going to be this Jewish utopia to where uh, anybody who isn't of Jewish descent is going to be subservient to the Jews. That is just, it's ridiculous. Now, it says here that the devil's going to go out and deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. Now, where, does the Bible talk about anywhere else in Scripture? Does it talk about two battles at the end of time? No. This battle here, no matter how you want to look at the millennium, no matter if you are dispensational or you actually know what, the Bible says, and you believe the truth, regardless, this battle here, uh, the battle that's talked about right here, when they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints around about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That is Armageddon. You know, I have heard even people who have dispensational tendencies like... Um, Oh, what's his name? Derek Gilbert even says in his book, I've got his newest book on Audible, and Derek Gilbert agrees that Revelation 20 verse 9 here is talking about the Battle of Armageddon. How can you know that that's the Battle of Armageddon, but believe that all these other things are happening at the end of the Tribulation, like the, the, the Millennium and Satan being cast into the Bottomless pit. Uh, yeah, I just don't understand that. I don't understand how you can know that the Battle of Armageddon is what is being described here, but think that the other stuff that that's described before it uh, is something that is happening at the, the end of the tribulation. That just baffles me. But back to the subject at hand, which is the two uh, resur I mean, the two judgments and the resurrection: the judgment of the righteous and the wicked, and the the resurrection and then the judgment.
All right, it says, and I saw a great white throne. Now listen to this. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Now it doesn't say the unrighteous. It says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And this is the part that, to me, shows that this is the judgment of both the righteous and the wicked that Jesus described in Matthew 25, the very first scripture we read tonight. It says, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. There would be no reason for the book of life to be opened for the lost only. Because we know that the wicked are not in the book of life, right? Right. And it says, And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now listen, this this last verse is like the key to me. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That is clearly saying that there were both those who were in the book of life and those who weren't. There were the righteous and the wicked together. Otherwise, there would be no reason to say whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It would have just said, and the dead which were delivered up were cast into the lake of fire. The same as it did in verse 14. In verse 14, it says, And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So it would have just stopped there if it was only the wicked being judged here at the great white throne. But that's not what it, it doesn't stop there. Verse 15 goes on and says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So, I mean, and, you know, we all have learned from going to church and, you know, listening to the preacher and also from reading our Bibles and those of us who went to seminary, we've all learned that we are going to be judged, Christians are going to be judged according to our works, not to go to heaven or hell, but to receive crowns and gifts to lay at the feet of Christ, right? All right. The unrighteous, the wicked, there's no reason for them to be judged for their works because the, there's only one thing that they are being judged for, and that is rejecting Jesus Christ, accepting the mark of the beast, worshiping the beast, and rejecting Jesus Christ. That is the reason why they were not in the book of life, and so they were cast into the lake of fire. But when the books are open, and the book of life is open, and then all of the dead are judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. I mean, it clearly shows here that this is where the crowns are given. This is where the rewards are given. And those who aren't found written in the book of life, those who are found written in the book of life are the ones who are judged according to their works, getting their crowns. Those who are not found in the book of life are the ones who are being cast into the lake of fire. So we see the same scene from Matthew 25 here. Those who are being judged for their works that were found in the book of life are the sheep that are on his right hand. Those who were not found in the book of life who are going to be cast in the lake of fire for the second death, these are the goats that are on his left hand. This is one judgment, friends. How many of you know that the Bible tells us that we will sit on the th a throne, we will have a throne, and that we will judge angels? How many of you know that the Bible tells us that? It does. So, when Revelation 20 verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus for the word of God. You know, like I said earlier, I do not see them being judged the same way that people are being judged at the end of Revelation chapter 20. I see them actually doing the judgment. I truly do. I see them doing the judgment. But, you know, I'm not stating this as a fact. I'm not stating any of this as a fact or thus saith the Lord. I'm telling you what makes sense to me and what I see after 
more study than I could possibly tell you. Not hours, not days, not weeks. A whole lot of study into this subject. I mean, this is probably one of the subjects that I study more than anything else because it is the subject that has baffled me throughout my walk with Christ more than anything else. It's the one thing that I have actually changed my belief on more than anything else. That is the millennial reign and the uh, when Satan is cast into the bottomless pit and when he is let loose. Um, and so therefore, in studying that, I have had to study the judgment and the resurrection because they go together as one. And you can't say that this one chapter in Revelation just completely trumps every other scripture that shows both of the judgments happening at the same time and the resurrection the resurrection and the judgments happening at the same time I mean I just you know Jesus himself is who said it in several different places and so we have to literally interpret the entire Bible through Jesus Christ, through the doctrine and the teachings of Jesus Christ. So, regardless to what I believe about the resurrection and the judgment, regardless to what you believe about the resurrection and the judgment, we have to study this through the doctrine of Christ. It has to be interpreted through the doctrine of Christ. And it really does not matter what I believe or what you believe. It's not going to affect the truth at all. Just because I believe one way and you believe one way, or just because the majority of people believe a certain thing, does not make it so. No matter what any of us believe is not going to change Scripture. It's just not. So I would just encourage you all to search these things out, pray about them, um, you know, I have pretty much gone through this all I had intended to go through tonight. I just wanted to go through the different scriptures with you guys and uh, look at the resurrections and the judgments and um, see if we could decide if there is one resurrection and one judgment or is there two separate resurrections and two separate judgments that are separated by a thousand years. So, that's what we did, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that we uh, came to a for sure conclusion, because, you know, there is a, we didn't do that. Um, I know that what I showed you guys and what I said is what I see, but I will say this, I am not so close-minded and so, uh, so prideful that I am going to say, this is what I believe, and I am not willing to change my belief. No, that's not the way it is. This is what I see. This is the interpretation that I see right now. But I am open to having my interpretation changed if it is the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that is what changes my interpretation of the resurrection and the judgment and the millennium. Uh, it won't be because somebody else shows me something or tells me something or anything else. It will only be the only way that my paradigm and my interpretation of this part of the Word of God would be changed was if the Holy Spirit and the Word of God revealed it to me as, you know, something other than this. So, um, you know, I would encourage you all to do the same. You know, do not be closed-minded. No matter whether you agree with me or disagree with me tonight, don't be so closed-minded as to where you say, this is what I believe and nothing's going to change that because uh, I promise you, God can bust your paradigm. The Holy Spirit can shift any paradigm. You know, I have found that out firsthand and I'm sure many of you have as well. Well, guys, uh, that is actually all the uh, time that we have tonight. I am trying to uh, get back to... Oh, there we go trying to stop the screencast and uh, we have been <laughs>
Tia said, amen, List and listening, not talking, LOL. Yeah, uh, that is pretty much going to do it for tonight's uh, Remnant Report. Uh, like I said, tonight was more of a Bible study than an episode, and I, I hope you guys uh, at least got something out of tonight's study. Um, you know, we did not come to any kind of for sure conclusion at the end of the program, but I knew we weren't going to when I started it. Uh, that wasn't my intention. My intention was not to change anybody's mind. My intention was to show the scriptures, you know, let the scriptures speak for themselves and let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and your mind. And with that, we are going to end tonight's program, and I hope you will join us again. We will, um, let's see, this week, Wednesday night, I've got something going on. Thursday night, I've got something going on. But Saturday, we should be having a program Saturday. So uh, just hit the notification bell on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook, Kingdom Productions on Facebook, so that you will get notifications when we go live. Be sure to hit the like button on YouTube and on Facebook. And if you have not already subscribed to the NCRN YouTube channel, I hope tonight will be the night that I earn your subscription. And guys, I truly am thankful for each and every one of you. I love each and every one of you guys. I truly do. And uh, so with that, for Next Chapter Radio Network and Kingdom Productions, I am the Remnant Warrior saying... Until next time, good night and grace and peace.